welcome to the Auburn Avenue Research Library's virtual story time. And welcome, I'm Forrest, one of the reference librarians at the Auburn Avenue Research Library, a special research library, a part of Fulton County Library System. In celebration of Pride LGBTQ Plus Month, we are joined by JP Miller in conversation for her Bayard Rustin title, a part of Leaders Like Us series. Today's discussion will explore the history and development of this title, as well as the Catalyst for Change Life, followed by a reading by the author. In Leaders Like Us collection, you'll learn about important African-American leaders, Catalyst for Change, and legends like Henry Louis Gates Jr., Shirley Chisholm, and others. Growing up in Ash. Ville, North Carolina, and a preacher's kid. JP spent most of her weekdays in school and at sports, but on the weekends at church, from their reading and her passion for literature to pursuing a degree at Tennessee State University in 1982. Truly her reflection of literature is also seen in her notable children's work today. Her drive truly guided her path and headed off into the wild blue yonder as an airman in the United States Air Force. And in 2015, JP retired from the United States Forest Service with over 30 years of federal service. And since then has devoted much of her time writing great and beautiful black children's picture books. And with no further introduction, JP Miller. Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. So good to be here. Thank you. And also with us is my colleague, Frederick Cox. How are you? Well, we'll start with our first discussions, questions, if that's all right with you. <laughs> sure. All right. Well, Ms. Miller, my first question, who were Bayard Rustin's biggest influences? Um, well, uh, Bayard Rustin had a lot of influences, but his biggest one was um, Gandhi. Gandhi and um, the whole um, peaceful uh, protests. Um, he really, he studied uh, Gandhi a lot and actually um, shared that with Martin Luther King Jr. Wow. Okay. Well, the civil rights movement was born in the South and was nurtured um, in the ideology of Southern leadership. In what ways have Rustin's Northern background contributed to the direction of the civil rights movement? Um, I just think that things were viewed a lot differently uh, in the North. And so um, he was able to bring some of that to the South. Not to say that the North didn't have uh, you know, prejudices and discriminations, uh, but things were a little bit freer, which is uh, probably what uh, was a guiding force in the, the great migration of people going north was that uh, it wasn't as much of a stronghold as, uh, as it was in the south. So I think he was able to bring uh, some of that mentality to the south and, uh, and, and, and aid in the civil rights movement and getting some of the things done, uh, particularly the peaceful way. Okay. So the book directly states that Rustin organized the March on Washington, but did not deliver a speech. Did he ever speak at any other civil rights events? Um, he did. Um, and I think he actually spoke that day. Um, I'd have to research that a little bit more, but I, I think he actually spoke that day on some of the, the footages that I have seen. Um, he actually spoke on the, the day of the march. As in, and speaking as an interview or uh, was he actually on stage and uh, delivered some message? Yeah, uh, from what I've seen, he's actually, he was actually on stage that day. Okay. Beautiful. Well, moving a little bit towards his personal influence, are you able to elaborate on Rustin's relationship with his grandparents? Um, he had a um, he had a very good relationship with his grandparents, and of course, uh, the um, Methodist Church um, that he was and the Methodist denomination that he was raised in. So he was raised in a, a very religious um, 
family as well. Um, so they uh, they aided him in, in uh, going to college and uh, kind of instructed him, you know, in going to college. And they had um, uh, they were activists within their own rights. Um, they they would um, often allow uh, activists that were coming to town to stay at their home. So he actually got to sit at the feet of a lot of those people uh, as a young child, and that basically is what guided and molded him to be um, the civil rights leader that uh, that he became. Now, among those people who stayed at his grandparents' house, you mentioned James Weldon Johnson and W.E.B. Du Bois. Besides Weldon, besides Johnson and Du Bois, what other prominent leaders lodged at the home of Rustin's grandparents? Um, I'm, I'm not particularly sure on that. I think that those are the only ones that I found in the research. Uh, but uh, I'm sure because, because of the time and it was very difficult for uh, African-Americans to uh, stay in hotels, um, a lot of them had kind of like boarding um, houses or boarding rooms, uh, but they were particularly uh, interested in uh, people that were doing um, speeches and civil rights type things to stay at their home. But I'm not quite sure of who all there actually was that stayed there. Okay. Wonderful. Well, the Black experience is not monolithic. Black and brown narratives from around the world, especially specific intersections, as Rustin reflected throughout his life. What challenges did he possibly face as a Black gay man involved in the civil rights movement? Yeah, you know, his, his biggest challenge, of course, at that time is that uh, uh, the lifestyle as a whole wasn't really that accepted. And, and it definitely wasn't accepted in the African-American community. And then him being, you know, the right hand man of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, a lot of times, uh, you know, he was, he never uh, denied who he was um, personally, but a lot of times he had to step back and not, not let his name be necessarily associated with Dr. King. So I think that must have been a very big challenge for him at that time. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Now you mentioned the influence that the AMA, AME Church had in directing Rustin's path. Did he ever make plans or aspire to be an AME minister? Not that I know of. Um, I, I don't think that he did. Mm. Okay, well, in his other efforts of activism, especially politically, in what was it 1944, Rustin was arrested uh, for missing a meeting that could have sent him to war. This has been over 20 years before Muhammad Ali protested the same draft. What can you tell us about this incident that isn't covered in the book? Um, I know it was uh, it was it was pretty much a. Um, uh, a catalyst for his um, demonstrations. Um, and it, it led to um, other demonstrations, which was uh, the, uh, the bus, uh, he, he started taking bus rides and, and, uh, and sit-ins on buses. Um, but I'm not really sure um, to what extent it really led and, and guided him in other directions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's such a great beginning, though. Um, I'm very glad that you shared that with us. Thank you. Yes. For all we know, it could have caused a domino effect that went from World War II through the Korean War to the Vietnam War and eventually uh, inspired Ali to take the stand he took. Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, uh, possible. Uh, you know, and, and one of the things about, you know, in the military um, at that time, as it was, was because African-Americans um, weren't really considered, um, well, it was all of the segregation um, that was going on when African-Americans were drafted to the war. Um, they really didn't necessarily want to go because you weren't, you weren't treated like a, a human here, you know, and so um, that could have very well 
um, you know, part of his reasoning for not wanting to go. I'm sure it was a major part of why he did not want to uh, participate in the war. And like you said, um, other people, it may have given other people strength um, to do so uh, latter, such as um, Muhammad Ali. Okay. Are there any more interesting facts to share about Bayard Rustin that are not in your book? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I, I like the, um, I, I just, you know, I like him for his courage. It takes a lot for a person to, um, to sit back and take a, a, um, a back seat when you know that you're, you know, kind of pushing and driving and, and being uh, the driving force, especially in uh, a campaign that was large as the March on Washington. You know, we uh, today, you know, in the office, if our boss don't give us credit for, you know, writing a certain letter, we get upset or, you know, uh, or, or being a, a part of a, a, a committee making a decision that was, you know, successful, uh, we, we get upset. And so just to imagine that that him through, uh, you know, during the civil rights um, uh, era, that he was such a major part of it, but, you know, in some instances uh, could not shine because of his lifestyle. Okay. So, so uplifting. Well, our last question before we get into our reading is, you know, his life story and work is truly a call to action for today. In what aspects of this story do you find most inspiring? Um, I just, you know, I just find it um, inspiring that um, in that day and time, and of course, you know, I say that day and time, which it really wasn't that long ago, but uh, that uh, the courage that people had to come together in the numbers that they had, uh, that they came together in. Um, I, I don't know if I've seen anything uh, it, it today that's comparable to some of the things that uh, the March on Washington, the Montgomery bus boycott, you know, things like that. I don't think I've seen anything today that's comparable of that. And so I just, you know, I just kind of revel in the fact that uh, it, during those days and times and they didn't have as, you know, the, the media and social media that we have, but um, he was able to to uh, to garner the people and uh, and and make change. Wow! Oh, thank you. You know, this has been just a wonderful collection of minds, and also just your openness and transparency. Bay Bayard Bayard Rustin, a part of Leaders Like Us, can be purchased and available at www.author jpmiller2020.com. And now it will be followed by a brief reading by the author. Hi, this is JP Miller, and I am going to read from the Bayard Rusted title uh, from the Leaders Like Us series. <clears throat> the March on Washington. Think of a time when something seemed unfair. How did you feel? What did you do? Bayard Rustin knew about working to fix unfair things. On August 28, 1963, daylight stretched across the city. Engines roared and horns honked. The people of Washington, D.C. were starting a new day. But Bayard Rustin was already hard at work. He had spent months planning the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. The big day was finally here. The clock ticked. Bayard was worried. What if people did not come? He did not worry for long. Hundreds of thousands of people were ready to protest. Black and white people walked arm in arm. They were tired of discrimination in America. That day at the event, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous, I have a dream speech. His speech gave many African-Americans hope. Becoming an activist. Bayard Rustin was born in 1912. Slavery had been against the law for 47 years, but black people were still not treated as equal to white people. Bayard's grandparents, Jennifer and Julia Rustin, were activists for equal rights. He learned from them.
Hotels near Bayard's family did not let African-American people stay there. Jennifer and Julia Rustin let visiting leaders stay with them instead. The visitors were part of the civil rights movement. Bayard met these leaders and learned from them too. Famous guests. The Rustin family had some famous guests when Bayard was young. The activists W.E.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson came to visit many times. At that time, black and white children had to go to different schools. Signs on buses told black people where to sit. They had to drink from different water fountains. It was the law, but it wasn't fair. Bayard wanted to work for equality. He had learned from his grandmother's Quaker beliefs. He went to college with the help of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He was going to be a leader. Leading from behind the scenes. Bayard believed in solving problems without violence. He made friends who felt the same way he did. He began teaching other people. He helped them plan peaceful protests, boycotts, and other events. Between the 1940s and 1970s, Black people marched, boycotted, went to jail, and died for civil rights. A peaceful life. Bayard learned about being nonviolent from Mahatma Gandhi. He was a lawyer and activist in India. He believed in fixing problems with peace. Bayard Rustin had a special place in the civil rights movement. He did not give famous speeches like some people. Instead, he planned and organized. He helped people run equal rights, equal rights groups. He showed them how to fight unfair laws without being violent. Some people treated Bayard unfairly because he was gay, but this did not stop him. The police arrested Bayard several times for his protest, but he did not quit. Bayard helped organize the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. It was the biggest march he had ever worked on. Bayard was an important leader on that important day. He helped make big changes for the civil rights movement and for the United States. Bayard's work didn't end once the March on Washington was over. He continued to work hard, organize and lead all from behind the scenes. Bayard believed that nonviolent work for equality could change the world. He proved that there are many ways to be an important leader and make a difference. And his quote is, we need in every community, a group of angelic troublemakers. Also in uh, the title, uh, there's a timeline of his life. In 2013, Bayard is awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom after his death by President Barack Obama. There's also a glossary and text uh, dependent questions and an extension activity. That has been the end of the Bayard Rustin story. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you again. And thank you again for joining us in conversation for Bayard Rustin, a part of Leaders Like Us series by J.P. Miller. This has been a wonderful collaboration with the Auburn Avenue Research Library for our yeah. word Africana story time. Thank I'm you, Paul, Ms. Miller. And this is my colleague, Frederick Cox. Thank you. Enjoyed it. All right.